Hey there, Bruce, and welcome back to Misery Code Volume 1. We're heading back to the Abbey because we are done in town. I don't know if it went well or not. I mean, we got the answer we came for, right? So I'm going to count that as a win. It was pointless to wait for the, for a break in the rain, or well, so my companion said. The ride back up the hill to the Abbey was much soggier than the trip down. Some other travellers in carts flanked by armoured horsemen passed us by at the village outskirts. They looked just as miserable as I felt. I could hear raindrops plinking against their helmets as they hurried into town. We sat in silence for the first third or so. I looked out the back of the cart toward the farmhouse chimney, yearning for the security of the fireplace until the building was out of sight entirely. I told the superior this was a bad idea, you know. You were wrong. Oh? Yes. I... I learned something very important today. Really now? Yes. It would be difficult to explain. We have time. Now, now, Eustace. I've already forgiven the poor woman. There's no need to torment her. I'm not tormenting her. I'm curious. Well, after... After we split up, I watched a parade go by. There was a parade? No. There wasn't. I've finally given up on trying to stare into the increasingly distant fireplace and turn to face Eustace. She looked tired. What do you mean a parade? I mean exactly that. I'm sure you can understand. I... I had a vision. Really now? Yes, I swear it. I saw a par parade, a procession of carts with my riders, all carrying grand kites and banners. And one of them, I thought at first, carried an effigy. But it was... Well, it got more mysterious after that, I suppose. What happened? Yes, tell us. This is very interesting. Well, I followed that particular cart for a while. I suppose that's how I ended up wandering away from the town square. Understandable. I had to tell you to stay put, but I might make an exception for a vision. Eventually I lost him, but then I was carried through the air. I know this sounds quite strange, and then whatever courage the fire had given me finally waned. I couldn't bring myself to explain the entirety of the experience to Eustace, whose expression remained, dare I say it, inscrutable? And then I came to, I suppose. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. You flew. She walked. That farmer saw her climbing the hill. Do you not believe me? I believe you felt like you were flying. I felt it. I saw it. I was in the air, however briefly. The man said you found him. He found you lying down in the grass at the top of the hill, getting soaked by the rain. I... I know it sounds hard to believe, but it's what happened. Eustace sighed deeply and pulled her hood tighter over her head. People don't fly. Perhaps flying is the wrong word. I was being carried. It's not like I had control of my faculties in the air. Like you were plucked from the earth by God's own hand. I... well, yes. Moira, the man saw her climbing the hill. So he says. Maybe he saw her after she'd come back to the ground, or maybe, maybe both things are completely true. How would that work? Well, Hedwig could have been carried and maybe the farmer was shown an image of her climbing. I mean, she would have been far away from the house, just sort of a shape, so he would go up and find her. So God carried Hedwig up the hill and showed an image of her to a man who was already nearby? Two divine revelations within, I don't know, 10 or 15 meters of each of each other? Darcy has visions all the time. Why is Hedwig having one so hard to believe? So now we have three people in close proximity all having grand visions? It does be bigger belief, just a tad. I think it's beautiful. Maybe this mountain is just special. Eustace let a squelching of the mud beneath the cartwheels answer for her. I... I just think it's possible, that's all. At any rate, it's a moot point to argue. I don't think Hedwig is lying, I just don't know if I can accept that it really happened. What about Darcy's visions? You had quite an interest in those, haven't you? Darcy's are different. In what sense? Well, she's never claimed to be f flying in any of hers. What does happen in hers, typically? Why don't you ask her and spare me the Inquisition? That was uncalled for. It's been a long afternoon. You can say that again. Can we... Can we all please make out before we get back to the Abbey? I'd like that. I'm sorry for being so hysterical. You're not hysterical. It was a cruel idea to force you into coming, I think. I'm sorry for insisting we stay longer. I wanted to tell Moira she didn't know the half of it. She didn't deserve to worry about having forced me to do anything when the superior demanded it in the first place. No, no, my behaviour was inexcusable, as it is all too often. I thought I caught a glimpse of Eustace rolling her eyes out of the corner of my eye. Perhaps she was just adjusting her spectacles. I feel like we're really paranoid. I can appreciate that this trip was an ex extenuating circumstance. Yes, I think next time... Next time I'll stay at the Abbey if it's all the same to you. 
We should at least take you on a picnic or some such. Small steps, you know. You can't stay cooped up in the Abbey forever. I thought that was rather the point. <laughs> oh, you know. You have a dark sense of humour sometimes, Hedwig. There was no handshake this time, but I didn't feel like I should push things any further. The rest of the ride up to the Abbey was sullen, but at the very least it was a slightly less uncomfortable silence than the one that preceded this conversation. I didn't like the uncertainty, but it would have to do. The rain was showing no signs of letting up when we finally arrived. It was particularly, I was particularly bedraggled. The indignity of the laundry water incident was something that would stick with me permanently. And as soon as I hopped out of the cart, I made a beeline for the dorms to change. Oh, um, Hedwig, where are you off to now? The dormitory. I must get out of these wet robes or I'll never be dry again in my life. <laughs> Why don't I draw you a bath? I had to admit, that sounded like a wonderful idea. You know, I think I'd like a bath very much. We all would after an outing like that, I think. What day is it again? Uh, November the 21st, I think. Perfect. I froze. I did not realise that Moira had meant we should all bathe together at once. I didn't like that idea at all. Oh, uh, perhaps I'll have one tomorrow. Nonsense. You'll catch cold if you don't. Do we even have time to heat water up for it? With any luck, someone else has already had the bright idea to take a bath today. I couldn't help myself. I groaned aloud and pulled my hood over my eyes. What's the matter? Uh... I suspect, well you don't have to join us Hedwig, but I think it'd be a good idea. I, I, well that decides it. Curse my wretched body. I would have escaped this humiliation if it weren't for that little sneeze. I'm sure of it. Oh, go on then. You two run up and get your, get your chain, change of frocks. Ah, uh, Eustace, would you mind getting mine? On it. We made our way upstairs to the dorms quickly, dripping water all along the way. At the top of the stairs, I nearly ran straight into Darcy. Oh good, you're back. I was just looking for you, Eustace. Hello, Darz. Do you have a minute? I need your help with something. Of course. Uh, Hedwig, would you mind getting Moira's clothes? Hers is the door between Catherine and Darcy's. Oh, uh, yes, I can do that. Eustace nodded and Darcy hobbled away, back down the staircase. Eustace stopped for a moment on the landing, however, and turned to me. That reminds me. You should talk to Darcy later, you know. Hmm? About your vision. Oh, yes, I will try to remember to do so. Eustace nodded, then disappeared down the stairs for Dar after Darcy. I quickly scooped up my dry frock from my dormitory. No suspiciously placed books on my dorm bed, I noted. I felt wrong to intrude on Moira's room, but at this point I desired nothing more than to get this whole exercise over with as quickly as possible. I opened her door and slipped inside, on the lookout for her spare clothes immediately. The last thing I wanted to do was gawk at somebody else's room uninvited. I couldn't help but notice how neat and tidy it was, however. There was a beautifully carved crucifix hanging on the wall above her pillow, and her reading desk was meticulously stocked with papers. A handsome quill sat next to an ink pot as well. To cap it all off, there was a beautiful little box resting on the desk next to the organised papers. The wood was clearly expertly carpented, and it was gilded in regal yet understated fashion. The whole room had a sense of carefully considered elegance to it. It was perfectly fitting for Moira. Simple but radiant, not vain but reverent. Please don't tell Moira I just described her as simple. I, I didn't mean it as an insult. Approachable? Uncomplicated? Steadfast in her positivity? The bath situation is a perfect example of what I meant. I'd been so cruel to her in the village and, to be perfectly honest, Eustace wasn't exactly kind to her in the cart either, but Moira's instinct was to bring us closer together. There's a simple beauty to that, I think so at least. Anyway, I quickly identified an impeccably folded set of clothes next to her bed underneath the window. I scooped them up quickly. As I turned around, however, ah, no, no, no. The pile of clothes I was carrying, I think, had brushed up against the quill resting atop her desk. I watched it tumble over and end, oh, end over end to the floor, carrying the ink pot with it. No. Black liquid oozed out of the pile of broken glass. I scurried away and closed the door behind me in a panic. I checked the bottom of my shoes. There was nothing there, thank God. In reality, it was dead silent, but I promise you I could hear the bubbling, oozing, and dripping of the undoubtedly expensive ink I just splashed all over the floor behind the door. If it's not one thing, it's always another with me. Was I being punished for dawdling once again? Should I have emphatically refused the offer of a bath instead of made a, making a beeline to the, and instead made a beeline to the superior's office? Should I have gone then, at that very moment? Truthfully, I only came to that conclusion a bit later. In the actual moment, all I could think about was what to say to Moira, or if I'd say anything at all. It's shameful to admit it, 
but I was frankly terrified of putting any strain on our relationship at all after my embarrassing display in town. Moira was endlessly forgiving, but I worried that even I could find an end to her graciousness if I kept imposing upon her. And so I decided I would leave this. I couldn't leave quickly enough. I practically flew down the stairs. Suddenly I was very eager to get into a bath. <laughs> a fun communal bath. Anything was better than being caught red-handed with a broken bottle of ink, even burying myself in front of Moira and Eustace. Well then. Moira was already in the tub by the time I arrived. She beamed as I entered the room. I kept my eyes low and deposited her change of clothes close to the edge of the wooden tub. Ah, was Eustace waylaid? Yes, Darcy needed her for something. Well, thank you kindly. I realised there were two tubs similar to the one that I had used to bathe my first time out of my cell. At the very least, I was relieved I was about to submerge myself in water rather than stand awkwardly in one of the many smaller wash basins stacked against the wall. I had been using those to wash myself whenever I could squeeze in a trip to the baths alone after I discovered to some horror that communal bathing was considered the norm here. I mean, you gotta save water, right? I thought two big tubs might be nice. The water's not hot, but it's pleasant. You filled these up fast. A miracle of engineering. This abbey is quaint, I will say, but I'm very thankful for the thorough plumbing. The builders didn't skimp on that at the very least. She raised an arm to point at the wall behind her and I instinctively shut my eyes. Oh, don't be silly. Anyway, the faucets are back there. They're quite quick. I, I had my own faucet in my cell, actually. But I didn't know it was connected to anything greater. Oh, you should take a walk around the system one of these days. It's quite fascinating. It's the oldest building here, if you can believe it. 200 years old at least, and it serves the kitchen, the baths, the lavatorium, and it keeps it keeps it all separate. I'm glad to hear it's all separate. <laughs> I never feel comfortable here otherwise. But it's apparently not far off the kind of water management you'd find in the richest castles. Truly, we are blessed. It might not always feel that way, but yes, I think we are. How does it work? I must admit I couldn't tell you. Sister Catherine showed me a diagram she found in the library once, but it was a bit complicated for me. I know much more about how bodies work than buildings, I'm afraid. Speaking of, she leveled a finger at me with a mischievous glint in her eye. Are you going to get in the bath? You're looming a bit. Oh, uh, well, go on. I'll shut my eyes, I promise. She squeezed her eyes shut in a fashion that she might have intended to be jovial, but I couldn't help but feel condescended to. Nevertheless, I sighed and began gingerly to gingerly shed my layers. I pulled up my damp clothes next to the empty tub, then stepped in as quickly as I could. If I could avoid being seen at all, that would be grand. I take it you're in? I am. The water was not as warm as the bath Darcy had drawn for me after I had le first left my cell, but it was still a relief to sink into it. Moira opened her eyes again, blinking comically. This is nice. Indeed. I sank as low as I could, and pulled my knees up to my chest. With my chin resting in the water, I could still peer at Moira over the lip of the tub. I didn't want to be seen, but I also did not want to be rude. So at the very least, I maintained eye contact. Black and blue. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, I was just thinking aloud. Your humours, they're black and blue, aren't they? I... well... mostly black. With a little phlegm for colour. Does that sound about right? No points for guessing that, I reckon. Eustace had appeared in the doorway. She was already removing her hood as the door closed. I looked away out of modesty as soon as I saw that she was casually shedding all of her clothes and haphazardly tossing them aside as she walked. <laughs> well, it's my job to notice these things. Do me next. That's easy. You're as phlegmy as they come, with just as much yellow bile sloshing about in there for good measure. You're like a big clever soup. Goodness gracious. When are we eloping? <laughs> Moira laughed and I could hear her flick some water in Eustace's direction. Then I realised something that gave me an instant sinking feeling. Well then, who am I sharing with? Oh, good question. I didn't really think about that. Oh, well, hurry up and decide. It's getting nippy. Can we not get a third tub? We only have the two big ones. Ah, we could play a game to decide. Too late, I made my mind up. I braced myself, but the splashing sounds that followed came from the other tub. I opened my eyes to see Eustace looking as nonplussed as ever sitting next to Moira, who seemed wholly unperturbed. Thank God, I thought. I've never seen you without your cap, Hedwig. I guess she had black hair, but I suppose I'm still surprised to see it. Really? I feel like I knew the moment I saw her. Are, are my humours that pronounced? Yes, but whose aren't? You put much more stock in that sort of thing than I do, I suppose. Well, it's my duty to know. True enough. What colour do you think my hair is, Hedwig? You're always wearing that thing in, in the bath, but I think I know. I'm asking Hedwig. Moira was still wearing her cap. She gestured at her head, 
dripping water onto Eustace's bushy brown hair in the process. Ah, uh, hmm. I wouldn't really know how to deduce that. Take a wild guess. <laughs> I frowned, squinted at Moira's eyebrows from across the room. Some sort of, I don't know, dark brown? Chestnut brown? Does the accent not give it away? Ow! Moira elbowed Eustace, chuckling. No cheating. It feels like there's a clue that you want me to recognise that I'm just not seeing. Hearing. Top of the morning to your head, Wig. I... I don't get it. Are you insinuating she has red hair because she's Irish? <laughs> oh my god. Don't say that. With an impish grin, Moira tugged her cap up a little. A few locks of jet black hair dra draped across her face. Oh. Huh. Just like you, Hedwig. How nice. Consider me surprised. Did you expect a fiery Irish redhead? <laughs> you win, you win. I genuinely had no idea what she was talking about. In fact, I was slightly irritated. I hadn't expected anything. How could I have? Even the considerate and kind Moira couldn't remember that until recently. My entire world had been a few metres across. Sorry for the misdirect. I couldn't help myself. Redheaded. Like King David. Hmm? King David had red hair. I thought he had brown hair. What does it say in the Bible? He's described as Rufus, which means red-headed. Oh, I always took that to mean, well, you know, red-faced. As in, the whole head is red. Really? Well, I can see that interpretation, but... Besides, in Song of Solomon, I remember thusly. Dialectus minus candidus... My lover is red-headed. His hair curly and black. Golden-faced is used similarly to red-headed hair, I should think. You... You might be right. This is so exciting. I'm caught between two true scholars. It's like I'm at a real council. It's our job. That's right. Still, I like Hedwig's interpretation. It's fun to think about David having red hair. It's dramatic. I didn't care for Moira's use of the word interpretation here. Either Eustace was correct or I was. And I didn't much, much like the idea of being wrong, but I was grateful for the support. The conversation subsided for a while, and I became all too aware of the fact that this was a peculiar state for three women who had been at each other's throats earlier in the day to find themselves. I worried that Eustace and Moira felt the same way and prodded them with questions. So, do you all do this often? I should hope so. Bathing is very important for your health. I think she means, you know, together. Oh yes, well, it's a little embarrassing at first I suppose, but it's efficient, isn't it? I don't really plan around it, but there's enough of us here that you're going to run into someone else eventually. It's how things are done the world over. The Romans had huge communal bathhouses. Monks washed together too. I must admit though, a private bath every now and then is to die for. I suppose I've been lucky. Whenever I've come to use a wash basin so far, I've been all by myself. Is it difficult being around other people, I mean? I, I really shouldn't have made, should have made sure this wouldn't be too big of a leap for you, especially after the day you've had. I'm quite alright, but I'd rather no one looked at me. Ever? That's right. Not while I'm in the nude, certainly. It's nothing we haven't seen before. They spoke in unison. Eustace down low, Moira way up high. Still all the same. But I understand. If I take my spectacles off, you'll just be a pale smudge. Would that help? I... well, I'd prefer that over being defined. Right you are. I'll pop them off when it's time to dry off. By the way, Eustace, are you ever worried you'll drop your eyeglasses in the water? Those are really expensive, surely. Unbelievably. I'm lucky to have them. They're huge. I dread to think how much they cost. Is glass expensive? Very. Oh goodness, yes. I'm sure you've noticed there aren't too many glass windows here. Let me think, there's the superior's office window, the chapel. I've had these for a very long time, and I hope they last. My eyesight's always been dreadful, but, but it could always get worse. Goodness, I'll pray for your sake. I wouldn't wish couching on my worst enemy. Couching? You cut the eye open and then... Ugh. I won't go into details. Thank you. So Eustace, tell us. How'd you afford those? That's a little forward, don't you think? True, but well, we're already in the bath, aren't we? Fair enough. <laughs> I did some work for a glassmaker a long time ago and took these instead of monetary payment. Oh, what sort of work? Same as I do here, really. Information organisation. Maintaining a library. Managing orders and logging events, that sort of thing. I was about to say that sounds like a lot of work for a pair of glasses, but I suppose none of us are being paid at all here. 
I get by fine. I don't miss the old job. What made you come here? Well, I'd always wanted to retire to the countryside. And once I had a sturdy pair of eyeglasses, I reasoned, what else could I possibly want for? Oh, I don't know. A rich husband, a beautiful home. <laughs> I never wanted those things. Nor I. I did once upon a time. Now though, I agree with you two, I think. At the very least, it'd take more than that to get me away from here. You know, over the past few weeks, I've been so overwhelmed by everything new to me. I'm not sure that I'll ever get used to it. This life of asceticism might feel simple to you, but I'll never, it'll never be simple to me. I was prepared to spend my whole life with much less than all this. That is a very helpful perspective, actually. Yes, that's, that's important to keep in mind, I think. Are you feeling better after everything? Everything that happened today, Hedwig? I don't know. Most of all, I just feel embarrassed. As I feel about my behavior in the misery cord, yet still, forget about it. Yes, there's no need to worry, really. I, I think I would fare worse if I were in your shoes. And, and we can help you get better. In fact, I think it's our responsibility. Perhaps it was because we were relaxed from our bars, or perhaps there was something to be said for being naked and vulnerable in a room with other people after all. But this second round of apologies for the day felt genuine. I wondered how the ink on Moira's floor was faring. It was hard to relax with that in the back of my mind. The conversation slowed down and we were focused on washing and scrubbing, and I soon realized that the most difficult challenge was yet to come. Uh, when we're all done here, it's time to, you know, get dressed. Could I go first? Hmm? Of course, but why? It was just like we've been talking about. I'm not used to all this, and it's a bit embarrassing. Yes, that's it exactly. Wouldn't it be more embarrassing having us sitting here watching you? Don't confuse her. I'm trying to help. No, she's right. I mean, the most embarrassing would be all of us at once. Why? Because then you'll both see me, and I'll see both of you, and we'll be close to each other. What if Eustace and I both close our eyes? That would work. Would it? Or well, what if you two went first and I closed my eyes? That seems more, I don't know, efficient? I wasn't aware that efficiency was a concern. Honestly, this is the most I've ever had to think about being naked. Hedwig, I appreciate the offer, but I'm happy with letting you go first. And closing our eyes? Yes, don't be difficult. We just said that we do our best to make her comfortable. I have no problem with that broadly, but it doesn't feel a bit weird to worry this much about seeing each other on the buff? Naked I came from my mother's womb and all that. Who cares? That's not for us to judge. It is a little bit. What about Matthew 5.28 or Leviticus 18.9? Again, with, Levi with the Leviticus, we're not actually sisters. I don't think that passage applies. Sister is a term of formal address. It has nothing to do with being actual siblings of any sort. I know you know that. She was right, of course, but that just irritated me more. I had really been counting on my superior scriptural knowledge to excuse me from being personally embarrassed, but alas. Thinking about it, Hedwig. I know this might be difficult, but how about we all just try doing it the normal way? Getting out and getting dressed all at once? I think Eustace is right to some degree. Judas! In what sense? It'll be more difficult in the long run if you don't get used to it. I, I don't think there's anything you need to worry about. I'll just keep bathing alone when there's no one here. Can we make a decision before I get too pruney? I think we should all get out on the count of three. You, you said you weren't going to push me as far anymore. Hedwig. There are three of us here, and we all like each other. You had a tough day in the village, but you made it back in one piece. Surely this will be easy compared to what you went through all around those strangers. I don't want to push you, but I also want to help you. And part of that, I think, might, be in might involve pushing you just a little bit. She's right. If I have no choice, I had nothing left to argue with. My day had been thoroughly confusing, and if mingling naked with my shameless sisters was to be the capstone of the whole affair, so be it. I don't think it was Moira's argument that convinced me, however. Or rather, it might have it might have been, but only because it made me consider the full weight of what I'd seen in my vision. I didn't know what it meant, but it certainly I certainly felt compelled by a newfound drive to stop stalling in every little aspect of my life. You do have a choice, but let us get it over with. So, what if I get a glimpse of your, uh, socket? Belchos? Good lord, that's so old, that's old fashioned. I'm a fancy little lady at heart. I took a deep breath and braced my arms against the edge of the tub. Eustace, however, was already standing up, drying herself with a towel, and, you know, I've been meticulously de detailed about almost every aspect of my days outside my cell, but would you mind if I glossed over the rest of this? I don't particularly feel like describing Eustace and Moira's bodies any further, or my own for that matter. I've ex excised several minor details from my story as it is, after all. 
I've been exhaustive. I will grant that, but I haven't told you every last meal I've eaten. I've not told you about every trip I've taken to the privies. I, I think our conversation in the bars was relevant information, but I think it will suffice to say that I do not enjoy getting dressed in front of my colleagues. But I was very brave about it. You can rest assured of that. Pruning is just as much my responsibility as a chronicler as cataloging. Wouldn't you agree? What is important about this whole deal is that I was actually quite courageous and did not make any sort of scene at all. I got dressed alongside everyone else and we departed the baths without incident. Incident, however, was not too far away. As we passed the rectory on the wall, on the way to the cloister, Moira gently grabbed my wrist. Uh, Hedwig, why don't we go in here? Whatever for? I, well, I have something I want to show you. In the rectory? We should go in. I was completely bewildered. The pair positioned themselves on either side of me and pushed me toward the steps up to the large wooden door. Oh no, I thought, this is it. They knew I'm nosing around about Catherine's death. They were in cahoots. They're going to have me killed. <laughs> no, I think I'd like to stay outside if it's all the same to you. Stop wriggling. Let's just go inside. It won't take a moment. No, thank you. What are you two doing? I'll scream. <laughs> the paranoia, man. I know someone was murdered, but come on. I was pushed through the large wooden doors. I stumbled backward into the room, bumping my backside into a chair that I held onto to stay upright. Gingerly, I turned around and... Took you long enough. The crowd was gathered around the rectory table, which was itself so laden with food I could scarcely believe it hadn't buckled. Everyone present was smiled widely, and I felt reassured to the very least that I was not about to be murdered in a dark room. <laughs> Welcome back, Edwig. How was the village? It was a valuable experience. I'm glad to hear it. What is all of this? A few days ago, some of the sisters approached me with a reminder that St. Cecilia's feast day was approaching, which, if I'm not mistaken, would be the feast day closest to your date of birth, yes? I think so. I never have... I had never had much need to track my birthdays whilst I was the anchoress. Christmas was my mental marker for the passage of time, although once I thought about it, I do remember receiving a more handsomely prepared meal once every autumn for a few years when I was still a child in my cell. Your friends suggest we celebrate. I must admit, St. Cecilia's Day is one that we've often neglected to mark with a proper feast day, but we all agreed it would be appropriate to throw a little bash for you. And for her saintliness, of course. I don't know what to say. Start with thanks, and we can go from there. Everyone chuckled. I smiled graciously, even though Darcy's remark felt more cutting than she likely intended. How rude of me. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Everyone murmured appreciatively in response and moved toward their seats. Moira patted me on the back as she walked to her seat with a twinkle in her eye. Everyone began plating food from the generous piles of poultry, fish and vegetables in front of them. I thought I recognised some of the carrots I helped Darcy harvest not long ago. A plump roast duck sat in the centre of the table. It all looked and smelled delicious. I apologised for the little ruse. Moira suggested the surprise. Guilty. Everyone here contributed a little, however. Isn't that right? I do believe it was my general idea at first, if we're collecting accolades. Yes, but I remembered the feast day. Darcy somehow found time to direct the preparation of this meal and make those wonderful fritters of hers to take to the village. Speaking of, did any of those make it back? Oh, um, no, we gave everything away. A shame, but not a surprise. I'm sure the town couldn't get enough of them. We all helped in the kitchen, too. Ah, I was distracted for a moment. Yes, Margaret, Adela and Flora all graciously helped prepare the meal while you were in the baths. Which, let us not forget, I had drawn beforehand. That wasn't a spontaneous suggestion on, suggestion on Moira's part. <laughs> this is all so elaborate. Nobody has ever done anything like this for me before. And don't you forget it. Another chuckle went around the whole table. I smiled weakly. Tears were welling up behind my eyes. Marta and I had the very important duty of taste testing. <laughs> That's right. And guess who set the table? I, well, thank you all very much. This is... I could feel everyone staring at me expectantly. This is really wonderful. I choked my words out, overcome with too many emotions at once. Mercifully, being on the verge of sobbing passed a simple gratitude to everyone else present. I was thankful, but I was also confused, anxious, hurt, terrified as I mentioned too many things at once. I didn't deserve any of this. I was not anyone's friend. I was a liar and a sneak. A dog set loose in the coop to root out a fox. I gawked across the table at the superior who smiled back at me. I found it incredible that no one got caught in the puppet strings connecting her and I as they reached between us for food. And if it's St. Cecilia's feast day, I'll be performing a little composition of mine in the chapel after our meal concludes. If anyone would like to join me for rehearsal beforehand, I would appreciate the assistance. Margaret? Catherine? I'd rather... 
there's nowhere I'd rather be, but I do think we have some urgent matters to attend to once this is over. Urgent? Well, we're all helping prepare all this for most of the day. I have some important tasks set aside. It was my pleasure. Just so you know, Hedwig. Uh, of course. Well, if it's urgent, of course you may be excused. Since when is anything around here urgent? Ow! Flora glared at Catherine, who maintained an utterly innocent expression. To everyone else, barring the, any emergencies, you're invited and encouraged to assist. Either way, we must all convene in the chapel later. This was met with a ripple of non-committal murmuring. I could tell the food was excellent, as was to be expected. But as I ate, I felt like I was sitting next to myself. I could not taste the juicy duck or the rich gravy. I was having it described to me second hand. Everything I could taste, smell, hear, and see felt like it wasn't really there. Are you feeling well, Sister Hedwig? Hmm? Oh, my apologies, I've had a long day. What was it like going down to the village? That must have been quite an adventure for you. It was... I'm afraid I did not adjust to the experience as well as I could have. It was all a bit stressful. But I think she'll do better next time. Perhaps a picnic or some such. Yes, we more or less came up with the same idea, didn't we, Hedwig? That's right. Wonderful news. I do apologize for the stressful assignment, Hedwig. It was the best I could come up with on short notice. She took a sip of wine but kept her eyes on me. Well, I suppose, I suppose it was all worth it for this. Here, here. Although, although I'm not sure, I wasn't sure it was, I was worth all the trouble. I'm not sure how I can repay you all for this. You've all been very kind and I'm well. You do not have to repay us for any of this. Absolutely not. This isn't the point. If you really must feel like you're doing something for us in turn, you could keep your self-flagellation to a minimum. You can indulge us in some questions about yourself. You've been out of that little cell for weeks now, and I still don't feel I know you as well as I should. That's a fantastic idea, if she's up to it. No escape. I'll do my best. In that case, where are you from? Germany is where I was born, but I don't remember anything about it. I suppose you could say I'm from here. You do not remember anything about where you were born? There's very little I can recall about my life before I took my oaths, I'm afraid. Is there anything at all you can remember? Any particular places? Your parents? I... No, I don't have any recollections of my mother or father. I'm sorry. Crimes, there's no need to apologize. I just can't imagine what that's like. Don't listen to her, Hedwig. That sounds positively blissful. <laughs> Hedwig von Lindbarrow. I do remember one thing. I think. It's hard to know. In fact, if it's a memory at all. But it is at the very least something I know I could have never... Could have... Could never have picked up on my cell. Everyone leaned forward slightly. I remember the smell of the ocean. That's all. For the most part, there are little bits and pieces I associate with that smell if I tried my hardest to recall, but nothing substantial. I was just about to say the smell of the ocean is one of my strongest memories as well. You and I have more in common than I expected, Sister Hedwig. Can you speak any other languages? I don't think so. My grasp of our own language leaves much to be desired. I'm not sure a second one would find purchase in my head. Perhaps you could forget a few phrases like find purchase to make room. <laughs> Catherine. I remember the saltiness of the sea if I try hard enough, I think. I think I could describe the sound of waves, but beyond that, my earliest memories are, well, the office of the dead. Ah, how beautiful, but morbid for a first memory. I don't find it morbid. It's a very comforting memory, actually. The bishop read it for you, I presume. I would have liked to have witnessed that. It was before my time. 20 years ago, I'd just taken the, bow the vows at Burn Grove. Yes, all in all, I remember it being quite a moving ceremony. It's lovely. I'm glad it's a positive memory for you. After that, it mostly becomes a blur. Not in a bad way. More like... It's more like the rest of my life up until very recently was one long meditation. Things tend to move faster and slower all at once in a small place, don't they? No. Time is the same always, I think. That makes a fair bit of sense to me, actually. It certainly describes how I felt after moving here. Which reminds me, how are my old stomping grounds, Hedwig? Did anyone mention me? She shot me an oddly piercing look. No. I'm afraid not. A shame. I'm sure the place is falling apart without me. The grapes they've been sending up to us haven't been tasting as good ever since you left. You know what? I think you're right. Hmm. Eat. We mustn't let all this food go to waste and we're due in the chapel for a little recital. Everyone groaned and the table-wide conversation dissipated as the sisters ate their fill. My stomach was still rather uneasy. I tried to eat as much of the admittedly delicious meal as I could, but I could not keep up with any of the others. I watched the others eat as I picked at my own plate. I couldn't help but notice that Angela was not present. 
I was not surprised that an event, even particularly, pa even partially in my honour, didn't interest you. I was inclined to agree with Angela's assessment. I was not worth this le level of pageantry. As I forced the last bits of food down my throat, all I could think of was the disappointment Moira would feel as soon as she entered the dorms. Her unwarranted kindness toward me would dissipate instantly as soon as she realised what had happened. I looked across the table at her innocent, smiling face. She would hate me the instant she truly knew me. The piles of food were slowly worn down to nothing. Conversation began to start back up again, albeit quieter and calmer. Everyone, it seemed, was at peace after this decadent meal in my name. Alright, we need to wrap this one up because we're shitloads out of time for today. But uh, we are back in the... Back in the Abbey having naked baths together. Pretty much nothing happened in this episode except... Uh, the more we go on, the less I like Hedwig as a character. Maybe it is not her fault because of the way she was like kept in a thing and she's never dealt with people and shit like that, but she's become more and more paranoid all the time. I understand that there's a killer out there, right? But does she really think Moira's a killer? Right? I mean, come on. Anyway, I mean, maybe she is. Fuck, I don't know. See you in the next one, Bruce. Thanks for watching. <laughs>